Okay, so I'm back with a few frames cached. This is looking much more promising. Notice how the sheer amount of particles is making this look much, much nicer. Of course, the more particles you have, the slower the simulation will be and the larger your caches will be as well. But in the end, that's the nature of the beast. Remember that we talked about this earlier. You will usually need a lot of space in your disk to cache all this amount of data. And you will also have to wait for long periods of time for these simulations to be finished. But let's go back to our waterfall. So one thing I mentioned as well is that I'm not liking this explosive particles, noting how we have particles flying quite far away. One thing I do like is the splashiness that we're getting here. And most of it is coming from the curl noise that we added to the points. But let's try to address now the splashiness of these particles. So what I'm going to do, first I'm going to stop this render. Is show you a very interesting technique. And this is something I love about the flip solver. You can always connect pop forces into a solver to control the particles. For example, one thing that is very natural is the drag in the particles. And especially in water and mist, you want at least some drag force to make the simulation more natural. In this particular case, the drag will also help us to avoid the particles from exploding. So I will press the tab key and look for the pop drag. So notice how the second input of the flip solver is named particle velocity. So I will connect the pop drag here. And I will also decrease the air resistance to 0.1. We don't need that much, probably 0.2. And I will create another flip book. Okay, so I've cached a few frames now. Notice how the particles are not so explosive anymore. So the drag is helping a lot. We're getting very nice splashes when the particles are hitting the rocks. Also, uh, we have this very nice splashy motion from the emission. One thing I still don't like is the water is probably extending too far, but that can be easily fixed, probably changing the size of the source. So at this point on, it will be a matter of tweaking the parameters that we've been exploring to achieve the look that you have in mind. And before we move into caching our simulation, I want to mention something that may be obvious at this point. Of course, in a scene like this, for example, that we have a waterfall, we don't want to see the waterfall forming in camera. So in this case, we would need at least 60 or 90 frames of pre-roll, meaning 60 or 90 frames before we can reach the point where the waterfall can be rendered. So this is an important thing to consider. So what I'm going to do now is make a few tweaks and come back with a flipbook of the full frame range. And I will also save the file so you can later come back to it and have the same results that I will have in my flipbook.